Well, thank you for tuning in today, and uh, we hope that you enjoyed uh, our series of videos that we put together. Um, we did have some questions, and so I'm going to answer the questions right now. Our first question of the day was from Linda McAdams, and she asks, how do you recover band information, and what is the longest distance band recovery from Tennessee National Wildlife Refuge? Well, Linda, in order to recover information, the bird has to be caught again. These are not little GPS satellites or anything like that. They don't come little enough for hummingbirds. So we have to catch them again. And by catching it again, and then as we talked about entering the data and then sharing the data, um, that's how we get our information. Uh, today we caught a female ruby throat that we first banded here at Tennessee National in August of 2017. And at that time that bird was an adult so you'd think about that, that that bird has made at least four round trips down into the Yucatan Peninsula, a, a distance of over 8,800 miles. That little three gram bird has flown that far. So over the six years here at the refuge, we have had 21 of those return birds, birds that were banded here and have come back here and we have caught again. It's, it's a pretty good record considering we're only here one time a year. Our next question is from Vicki Rogerson, and her question is, so is the sugar carb content in the feeder turning into fat for migration? Yes, it is. The carbohydrates in the sugar, along with a lot of insects, soft-bodied insects, produce fat, and that fat is the fuel that helps these birds go from place to place and helps them migrate. Uh, you see, birds don't normally carry fat because it's only extra weight. But this time of the year, they're genetically programmed to start eating and eating and eating and eating, which is the reason why they're crazy at your feeders, so that they can put on that fat and so that then they can migrate down into the Yucatan Peninsula. Okay, so now let's talk about some other common questions that I'm asked every time I'm at a festival when I'm banding. And that is, does banding harm or traumatize the hummingbird? Well, the first you need to understand that hummingbirds and birds in general are about three things. Eating, not being eaten, and reproducing. And that's pretty much who they are and what they do. All the other feelings are we're putting on them. But uh, we know that this process doesn't hurt the bird because, A, we see these birds back year after year after year, so they are living through the experience to come back to see us. It, we are also highly trained to do this, so we are trained not to hurt them, to hold them a certain way. We're also asked sometimes whether the bird can feel the band on the leg and make it fly funny or fly to the left or fly to the right depending on what leg the band is on. Well these bands are extremely lightweight. They are a titanium alloy product and when you put the band on the leg and the bird flies off, sometimes you'll see it light down and it might pick at it for a minute. But then like your wedding ring or your watch, it soon forgets that it's there and it doesn't cause it any, any harm to have it on its leg. You need to know that these bands are, like I said, super lightweight and you can actually take 5,500 of them, put them in an envelope, slap a first class stamp mail on them and send them in the mail. Another very common question that I'm asked is, where are all my hummingbirds? We see them arrive in April and they start to show up at our feeders and then all of a sudden they seemingly disappear in May and June and people wonder, where are they? Are they have they all died out? Where'd they go? During that time of the year, it's breeding time. And during breeding time, hummingbirds need a lot of natural food sources, a lot of insects, and a lot of natural nectar, and they always prefer that kind of food. They need a lot of uh, carbohydrates and protein in order to produce their eggs and to feed and take care of their young. So they're around, they're just not at our feeders. But then we have this time of the year when fall migration begins, usually in around the middle of July, and the, you'll see your numbers start building up at your feeders. And that is because the young have started to fledge from the nests and are flying around with the adults. And remember, everybody's competing for the food because everybody needs to get fat so everybody can make it down into the Yucatan Peninsula. Which brings me to another question. Folks often believe that the bird that arrived at their house in April is the same bird that's there on the 1st of September. 
Well, I hate to disappoint, but that's probably not the case. Migration is an ever-changing flow of birds. The best way to think about it is think of a river. It's constantly flowing and constantly changing. Birds in today, birds out tomorrow. So the birds are always changing and, and migrating on until there are no more to come. I'm also asked many times what species can be seen at your feeder. Well, as Joan mentioned much earlier in the day, uh, it's all ruby-throated hummingbirds. You could recognize the adult male ruby throat by that nice red throat. But the ones without the red throats are also ruby throats. They are just females or young birds. So it's only ruby throats this time of the year at your feeders. And finally, please remember that if you choose to leave up a hummingbird feeder this winter to hopefully get one of those rare western birds and you get a bird at your feeder after November 1st in Tennessee or in Mississippi, please give me a call or contact me at southeasternavianresearch.org and I'll arrange to come to your place and ban that bird. If you live out of those two states and you still want to do it, I can find you someone, so contact me as well. And thank you and happy hummingbirds.